shores of Nova Scotia to the rocks of Newfoundland to the streets of Quebec City I'll be your wandering man from the Gulf Stream of St. Lawrence out to the Prairie Song up in the Rocky Mountains I'll be wandering on I'm wandering on I'm here in the Caribou Mountains in central British Columbia. I've come here to meet Dave Jorgensen. Dave is an adventure guy, and his specialty is helping people to experience the magic of the wilderness through a canoe. He does it right here at Bowron Lakes. Bowron is one of the most famous canoe routes in all of the world. This is a place to experience the path of the paddle and the magic of the wilderness. I'm ready, are you? Let's go. The canoe uh, is the consummate watercraft for what we're about to do. It's, it's as Canadian as the beaver, right? These canoes are based on the same design that people have been using for so many thousand years. When we reach the shore or we leave the shore, we always make sure that the canoes are floating before we get in. Paddles come in a variety of sizes and shapes, and uh, this particular paddle has been a variety of shapes in its past. Right now, it happens to be what's called a Voyager style paddle. Uh, and uh, it allowed them to use really rapid paddle strokes. Uh, and that's what they did. They paddled like 60 or 70 strokes a minute. When we get out there, I'll show you how fast that is. It's pretty amazing. The birch bark canoes, you know, they are absolutely amazing. You could identify where a canoe was from just by looking at the shape of it. Because all the way across Canada, every native tribe made their canoe to fit their environment. So if you lived in northern Quebec, then you had a canoe that had tons of rocker to it, but it was shaped like a banana so it could turn on a dime. Because in northern Quebec, they got fast rivers and big rocks. And if you lived along the north shore of the Great Lakes, well, you spend lots of time in big water, so then you wanted a canoe that could track really well on big water, and you could use a big boat. And the birch bark canoe, you know, you could repair it anywhere. If you tore it on a rock or damaged it on a beach, you just peeled a piece of birch bark and got some spruce gum and, and uh, patched up that spot, and laced it together with some spruce root, and away you went again. Sometimes people ask me, how can you go and do this over and over again and paddle the same spot? Isn't it boring? When you're out here, you feel everything. And you feel the moods of the place. And so you can paddle by the same spot a hundred times and every time it's got a different mood. 
It's like saying, are you bored with the person you love? Because there's always nuances about the place that, that make it rich. Well, I think people are attracted to this because it is so much simpler. But it comes with payoffs, and these are the payoffs right now. Because you can let all of that technology slip behind and all of the demands. And you only have one demand, and that's how you're going to get through the day. How you're going to... What's going to take you to the lunch stop, or what's going to take you to the next portage, or how you're going to adapt to the wind, or... All of these things are singular problems that you have. Canada. Why are they connected? Well, Canada is a boreal nation and the key ingredient to that is the birch. And the other key ingredient is water. We got water from one end of the country to the other and we have birch growing from one end of the country to the other. We exist because of the fur trade and the rivers were our highways, the rivers and lakes and what defines this region of the world differently than any other region of the world. And it's such an intimate part of our history. I'm not sure all Canadians really grasp that. You know, people see the beaver on the nickel, but I don't know if they know really why, why it's there or why it's so important to us. But it's the fur trade and canoes that made our, made our country. In the 1920s, when they were running an outfitting business here, uh, this portage was part of, at the time they were running canoes with motors up here. And the guys that were doing this actually built a railway across this portage out of wood and then brought in an old car chassis and just ran it on the rims over, back and forth over this railway. They built a winch up in here. But uh, when it was made into a park, all of that was taken away. And, so for us, we've just got this trail, it's uh, about 300 meters long, and uh, it's going to drop us into Skoy Lake. Side here, put it on your hips. Okay, and I'll reach across with your left hand, and on three, we'll go one, one, two, two three. This is the way it is. Imagine yourself a voyager with a 90 pound pack strapped to your forehead. Could be a lot worse. The Grand Portage was, uh, I don't know, well over 10K. How long is this one, Dave? Oh, well, we're a good 16th of a mile anyways. Oh, it's no problem, no problem. Later on, I'll show you how to carry it all by yourself. Let's do it. All right, now we made it. Okay, which way we... How's it feel? Good. We're gonna go over the left side. This side. Yeah, that's right. Okay, here we go, ready? Down it goes. Why are men in such desperate haste to succeed and at such desperate enterprises? If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music he hears, however measured or far away. Here, here.
here, eh? You bet we will. By nightfall, we are inside the heart of the lakes. No cities, no technology, just Dave and I, and the silence of the wilderness. We didn't talk much that night, mostly just sat by our fire and listened. Sometimes in the wilds, the silence is the most beautiful sound of all. having a small log cabin in a beautiful wilderness setting like this and living on a small mountain lake. That's where I would find my paddle music. Paddle music, I don't know. Can you hear the drop there? That's paddle music to me. The paddle slicing through the water. The chirps of birds, the odd loon. Just that sort of audio sensory experience that you get and that you're part of but you know in a really subtle way that's paddle music Feels like heaven to me. We got mountains of green, a clear running stream. I tried to wake up, but it wasn't a dream. I was paddling on a river, paddling on down to the sea. They call it the wilderness, feels like family. And I wouldn't go back, even if I could. I never knew my soul could feel so good. Paddling on a river, paddling on down to the sea. There's a duck at the door, a dog on the floor. Open up my window, see an osprey soar Paddling on a river, paddling on down to the sea Maybe I'm losing my mind and finding my sanity La 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 Paddling on a river, paddling on down to the sea Maybe I'm losing my mind, finding my sanity. By a big pine tree, a moose running free, 
Everything living is a teacher to me Paddling on a river, paddling on down to the sea We call it time, I know it's eternity And I wouldn't go back even if I could I never knew my soul could feel so good Paddling on a river, paddling on down to the sea Paddling on a river, paddling on down to the sea Well, I mean, the thing about paddling is, look at us. We have these tools that connect us really intimately with where we are. I've got this paddle in my hand and, you know, it's connected to the water and I'm connected to the boat and the whole thing moves in a rhythm and, and it's all dictated by how it is today and where we are today. Chris Harris is a nature photographer who has canoed Bowron Lakes many times. Although it was our first time meeting, within minutes we were chatting like a couple of old friends. Chris regaled me with marvelous tales of his experiences on the Bowron. Well, my first book was uh, The Bowron Lakes, uh -huh. British Columbia's Wilderness Canoe Circuit. Well, I uh, bought a paper to read the sports page one day, and I saw an article, it was a fishing article by Lee Strait and it was about fishing on the Byron Lakes. And although I wasn't interested in fishing, I read the story with great interest because he was describing this amazing canoe circuit. So at the time, I only knew one person in, in BC. And I phoned him up and I said, Dean, uh, I, there's this amazing canoe adventure up in, uh, up in the north somewhere. Do you want to go? And so off we went. And uh, it was there that we became buddies. We became best friends around the campfire. I tell you, it was a real adventure. There were no bear caches, and uh, the trails were troughs full of mud. And we were from the east and knew nothing about wilderness, and we had just heard stories of bears and all the trouble that we were going to get into. And so, like every night was an adventure about how to hang your, you know, throwing ropes over trees and trying to hang food up, and really not knowing anything about anything, but having an amazing time. You know? You know, when, for, when people first go around the Barren Lakes, it's usually about uh, it's a physical challenge. It's whether they can do it, and whether they can paddle, whether they can get down the chute and the river. And that sort of occupies one's mind, as it did ours the first few times we went around. But having been around the lakes 117 times, I no longer think of the physical or the, or the challenge aspect. For me now, the trips are visual journeys. And that means every trip is a first because nature never duplicates itself. The lakes are a very special place for me. They're quiet, they're, uh, they're, it's a space for inner thought, for contemplation. And uh, for me, it's, it's about seeing. I try and show people worlds which they just do not see. The best dawn is on, is on the Barren Lake Marsh. And it's, uh, it's one of the largest and most spectacular marshes I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And my record was see seeing 32 moose in one hour on, on this marsh. Uh, Joe Wendell's cabin overlooking the Barren Lake Marsh is the oldest cabin on the canoe circuit, built back in the 1920s. And uh, I must say, every time I stop there, I go up in front of that cabin where you get a view out over the marsh. I mean, that, that marsh would have been you know, living wildlife and birds. And uh, he trapped extensively in there, but in the end, he turned out to be one of the main uh, um, pushers toward it being preserved and put aside. So he became a conservationist, one of the earliest conservationists in the park. The Byron Lake Canoe Circuit is unique in the world. There is nothing like this anywhere in the world. 
you canoe for 120 kilometers and you end up right back where you park your car. And it takes you through the Caribou Mountains, glaciated peaks on the east and, and glacier carved, scoured out marshlands in the west. It is so diverse. There are five biogeoclimatic zones in this park. Yet after a certain point when um, you become one with your paddle and your canoe and you don't think of paddling anymore, your canoe responds to your every whim and thought and it becomes an art form. Inside the Bowerin, I had experienced a rite of passage and lived in a world few people are experiencing in our modern times. One can only hope that sacred places like the Bowerin survive and flourish, as the First Nations say, for the next seven generations yet unborn. My odyssey to Bowerin Lakes was truly a heavenly dream. Once there, there was only the desire to dream forever and never to awaken or return to the world outside. But then, I heard a new song in the wind and I knew it was time to be wandering on. <laughs>